everyone. I'm so excited to have everybody here. Um, it's such a, gonna be such a fun event. So my name is Tina Perez. I am the director of the beauty um, business program here at FIDM. And we have just put together the most fun and exciting event for you guys. And we're basically doing it because we want to have fun with this too. So here we go. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be introducing to you the beauty innovation challenge, um, but not just to have you do a challenge, but to also give you a great opportunity to meet some of our alum who are working out in the industry, as well as some of our current students, and to give you um, beauty junkie an, an idea of what it's like to create product and what the process is is to create a product to bring to market today. There are so many exciting new products and exciting new brands coming onto the market. And the question is, how did they get here? And what's the process? And hey, is this really a job? And do people really do this? And so absolutely, it is a job. And it, absolutely, people do this. And absolutely, you can go to school to learn how. And if you can't come to FITM, well, we're going to give you 90 minutes of a quick education. So for the next 90 minutes, first we're gonna do, I'm gonna give you an overview of the challenge really quickly. Then I'm gonna introduce you to our four amazing panelists. And then um, two of our current students who are currently working in the program and, and who helped out with this challenge. And then also we're gonna come back and do a q and A. I I know that on a lot of these, um, you get frustrated because all you hear is babbling heads and you're like, but I wanna, I wanna ask my burning, dying question. I'm here to, see this person. And so guess what? We're going to give you as much Q&A as we can so you can ask those questions. Now, chat is a great place for you to just kind of get your conversation going and to make some comments. But if you want a question answered, please put that in the Q&A. That's where we're looking. And to be honest, it's not just um, background people looking. The panelists and my students are also looking at the Q&A today. So they're going to be try to be very active and answer those for you as well. Um, and then also join in in the comments. So you've got a great access to everybody who's here. And um, let's just, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I'm gonna take a breath. I'm gonna focus, cause you know, it's so hard to focus in life, right? It's so hard to push everything else out of our head and just take a minute and pay attention. And you know what, this is just gonna be a really cool experience for everybody here. So take that second and take that deep breath get your brain in the game and let's have some fun. So let's talk about the challenge first. The challenge is lifted right out of the beauty marketing and product development program here at FITM. At FITM, we have an AA in a beauty marketing and product development and we also have a bachelor of science in beauty business management. So what we've done is we've taken a few key principles from both of those programs and tossed them in here to give you a little bit of an idea, a glimpse of what goes on in this industry. So we're giving you a small taste of what it's like to create a new product. And we're gonna do that from the perspective of trends, ingredients, product development, and marketing, all right? And so we're going to then offer you an opportunity to take a challenge and create your own product, all right? We're gonna give you an ingredient that's your motivation and your focus. So it starts you and you'll understand why we give you an ingredient to get you started. And we want you to take that ingredient and we want you to create your own product idea and your own product concept. And we're gonna go right back to the word I used at the beginning of this. This is about having some fun. So do not let your insecurities and doubts stop you from participating in this challenge. You've got absolutely nothing to lose. So you might as well do it and take it on, right? What we want you to do is create a 60 second TikTok hashtag FIDM challenge, F-I-D-M challenge and submit your concept onto TikTok, all right? The members of the panel and the students and myself will be judging these. Um, you have to submit by midnight, March 1st, and we'll be doing the judging and um, we will present the winner on March 8th. Now, the winner, what does the winner get? Well, in my opinion, they get fame and fortune, um, you know, but everybody's version of fame and fortune is different. So, but you definitely, in my opinion, get fame and fortune, but you're also going to get amazing prizes from our panelists and the companies that they work for today. So the brands that the panelists work for are about face, good opportunity to get up the front on that one, Petite and Pretty, NYX and Smashbox. And these are all just kick butt brands and so you can, expensive brands. So you're gonna get some nice freebies here in a really good basket. So you wanna you wanna win that and you wanna win the bragging rights, all right? So 
what I want to do now is I'm going to bring forward our four panelists. So I'm going to ask them all to turn their cameras and their mics on. So let's see if they can do it. Right. <laughs> and we're going to, I'm going to introduce them so you know who we have here today with you. All right. So I'm going to bring them up in the order that they're going to present. So there's no special alphabetical order or personal preferences here, just to let you know. All right. So our first presenter today is going to be Jackie Carter. So hi, Jackie. Jackie is an alum from the AA program. Well, they all are, right? Um, she has extensive experience in color cosmetics and skincare for over eight years. She's worked for brands, including Stila, and you guys are gonna realize there's a theme here in a second, but she's worked for Stila. She's worked for HCP, which is a packaging company that does a lot of the behind the scenes secret stuff that nobody realizes. She's worked for Glam Glow house labs and right now she's the senior manager of packaging development at about face by halsey so she's um she's been you know working with some pretty big names in her day here uh her focus i think i don't know we'll talk to her in the q a and find out if her focus was always meant to be packaging but jackie's focus is really in her career focused on packaging a lot and she teaches our package development and production class so she has extensive insights into the nuances of what it takes to really make a difference on shelf. So she's going to be coming back in a second or staying on, but she will be leading off with our trend conversation and I'll explain why. Our second panelist is Maritza Ispiro. Maritza, no surprise, an alum from the AA program, right? She has 14 years um, broad, 360 degree uh, view ex experience in the industry, right? She's seen almost every side of the industry from marketing to product development to packaging and dabbled in a few other areas as well. She's worked for AII as well as Hatch and Hatch Beauty is an incubator which helps a lot of brands out as well. So you start to realize most of you here kind of think there's always the big brand names, but what you don't realize is there's a lot going on behind the scene with brands as well. She's also worked for Mark Wins, which owns Wet and Wild and Black Radiance. And now she's been with NYX for four years as the director of product development. She used to teach fundamentals of skincare for us, but you know, when she decided to spearhead product development for a brand that has over 1500 items um somehow she got too busy i don't know why <laughs> all right our third uh panelist today is kia raglan kia is an alum yes from the aa but also from the bachelor of science and business management here is fitum as well she's also a cosmetologist um and she currently works for Estee Lauder Companies as the director of Global PD is Smashbox. Um, she's also a professional makeup artist and uses that in all of her product development experience, which has led her to be an award-winning product launch is across all the brands, um, so many different brands that she's worked for and so many products that there are too many to count. She is definitely committed to breaking barriers on what is seen as beautiful. And um, she creates some of the most creative and diverse products on the market today, definitely. And then last but definitely not least is Caitlin Nobles. Caitlin is an alum from the PD program, which means she came to us with a prior degree already and just did the one, um, one year program in product development and marketing. She has over 10 years of marketing experience in product development, but also visual merchandising, which is a really cool side. It's one of my favorite sides of the industry. Um, she wore, has worked for Napoleon Purdy's Stila. So, and I think at Kia, you were at Stila for a little while well too, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's the theme running through here. <laughs> um, and she also has, Caitlin has now also helped launch the brand Petite and Pretty and is currently their director of product development. Caitlin teaches our fundamentals of cosmetics class here at Fitum and is well renowned for her energy, her enthusiasm, and her positivity. If I could take a little dose of Caitlin every day, life would just be peachy key. <laughs> All right, so those are our four panelists. Um, and so we're going to ask three of them to drop off right now. And I'm going to stay on screen with Jackie. Um, so as I mentioned to all of you, we're going to go through this in four stages. We're going to talk about the whole process of creating a product from um, four different places. And the first place we're going to start is trends. Right. And the reason we're going to start with trends is because it's really the starting point for any new product. Right. It's all about 
what's going to be popular in the future. And it's all about helping you to figure out how you're going to stand apart in that. Not that you're going to jump on the bandwagon with everybody, but how are you going to take that bandwagon and be different? So on that note, I'm actually going to get out of here and I'm going to let Jackie take front and center and talk to you about how she uses trends and has learned to use trends in her product development career. Take it away, Jackie. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm Jackie. Um, currently, I'm a package developer at About Face, which Tina said. I've had an extensive career of, you know, figuring out what my passion is over the past eight years. I've gone from customer service to packaging sales to really understanding that, like, my passion is the technical side of, uh, of development. Um, and with all of all of the parts of the beauty industry, packaging and development sees trends come and go every day. Some trends have lasting power um, and others are just seasonal. And part of the panel, I'm just gonna review the next four topics on this slide that are really important to think about when you're developing products. So the first thing I'm gonna go through is why are trends so important? Why is it such a massive thing that development and marketing teams have as part of their research and development. And trends are important because if you look at the past and current product landscape from color to skincare and even outside of the beauty industry, you have to come up with new and innovative ways to develop and market your products. You can't just keep, you know, churning out the same product season after season because consumers become overwhelmed, there's too much saturation in the market, and there's nothing new. So you just don't decide one day that you're going to like come up with a trend. It takes years, um, sometimes months, to come up with trends, but there are really there's teams behind it. There's your product development team, there's your marketing team, you can hire trend houses, um, and, you know, even like the chemist or entrepreneur spirits really come up with what's going to be on trend. And they're working on those silently in the background without any recognition. Um, so if something is already a trend and you haven't thought about it, you're kind of already behind the ball and you should really be thinking about what's next and what's going to fit into your brand. Um, another reason that trends are really important is because they help you to figure out and forecast what will be important to consumers and even to just society and, you know, the world landscape going forward. If you look back three years ago, clean and sustainable beauty was just, you know, niche brands were doing it. I used to work at a beauty boutique on the side. It was all clean and sustainable, but she was doing such small orders because, there wasn't a need for it. And just in the past year and a half, it's blown up. Every brand wants clean formulas. They all wanna have some kind of sustainable approach. And even you see now retailers like Ulta and Sephora are also leading the sustainable and clean forecast. Um, but just imagine being a brand three years ago and you're being told no by retailers, your products aren't gonna go anywhere. Um, there's not enough pigment payoff, there's not enough long lasting powder power. And now you really see vendors and formulators changing the landscape. They're really striving to make products that consumers want and that are on par with so-and-so dirty formulas. Um, so I think that's a big importance of trends is figuring out where the landscape is gonna go. Um, so the next thing is, is like, how are you going to determine what trend will be perfect for your brand? How will it fit into your brand? Um, you really have to assess the customer desires, um, which are done by researchers, by trend and marketing agencies, developers, and entrepreneurs. And if you look at the consumer behaviors and interests to come up with, um, you, you come up with everything from short-term trends to long-term trends. What's going to be in season next season is not going to be what's going to be in season in two years. So that's where all of these teams come into play. And a great way for me to observe trends is to look at stylists, um, to look at what developers and even the, fit, the fashion industry are doing. 
Um, another great one is also looking at like the food and tech industry. They're always coming up with new and innovative ways. And beauty's kind of at the tail end of that, unfortunately. I think we are getting better about, you know, figuring out and hopping on the trend, trend wagon faster. Um, but it's just, you know, keeping your eye out on the market. I follow way too many Instagram accounts just because I always want to see what the landscape's looking like. Um, let's see, like a good trend example is brow soap. If you would have asked me two years ago what brow soap was, I would not have known. Um, but at my last company at House Labs, we did some research on brow soap and we were trying to come up with a formula. Fortunately, we didn't launch anything, but Maritza, who's at NYX right now, gave me her, um, her example of they, they launched a 16 hour brow glue that is on trend and it's, it was on time. They launched it and they weren't behind the trend. They were just perfectly on it. And it's because they had people like Maritza and their product team and their marketing team looking ahead, what was going to be new and really pushing the vendors to get the products out in a time where COVID really did disrupt the beauty industry. You weren't producing as much, but to stay on trend and to launch something like that brow soap is such an accomplishment in its own because they saw that gap in, in the landscape and they wanted to launch it. Um, and if they hadn't started their research when they did, they probably wouldn't be launching it until 2022 and then the trend would be over. And you know, you're know you not gonna have as much sales impact when you launch late. Um, so when you're looking at launching some kind of trend item or figuring out where trends fit, you really have to look at it holistically to see where it lives in your lineup. Is it a short-term trend or is it something like sustainability um, where you wanna keep it in line for you know the foreseeable future, if not improve on it constantly? Um, so the third question that you have to ask yourself when you're looking at trends is, do you want to be a trend pioneer or do you want to be a trend chaser? So I think when you break it down to it, there are the two categories. Um, so, you know, there's the third category, which is like brands who don't participate in trends at all. But trend pioneers are always your first on the market. They're your brand that has discovered some kind of untapped potential. Um, and the problem is sometimes trend pioneers aren't so successful at the beginning. They aren't successful right off the gate. They have to take years of believing in their product. It will gain momentum. And like, you have to think, do you have the patience for that? Or your, will your brand just like deem it a failure, discontinue it and pull it off the shelves? Uh, I, think, I think a great trend pioneer um, is benefit you know, 10 years ago, they launched all of their brow categories, but their teams were silently like researching and working and traveling to understand what was popular in other countries, in other categories. Um, and they also wanted to rival Anastasia. You know, they started with beautiful formulas and stock packaging, and then they moved over to custom packaging and the category exploded. Um, when I think of trend pioneers in the brow category, I think of Anastasia Beauty and I think of Benefit. Those are like my top two and there hasn't been a third one in my opinion who's like broken into the, into the category. Um, and then there are trend chasers. So those are the brands who unfortunately when they see a trend start, they hop on the bandwagon. But the problem is it takes six months at the least if not a year to develop a product. So by the time they're launching, they're already behind. Um, they're not gaining momentum. They're not launching as quickly. And it's not a bad thing. It's just that you need agile teams and manufacturing partners who can help you move quicker, um, which is when you know some trends will fall off the, fall off the bandwagon um, and you can't meet your timelines. So for me, I prefer for trend pioneer brands. Um, I think that about base is a great example. They see this make believe makeup movement, um, which is more of a seasonal or like kind of like a seasonal fashion inspired trend. And that's where we're going. Um, and on that point, there are, you know, a category of number dif of different trends, 
for today, I'm just going to break it down into four. So I think that when you think of trends, you normally think immediately of ingredients um, and like makeup looks, but there are trends to every aspect of your brand and your company. So you, you can start it with marketing trends. Marketing trends are things like celebrity founded makeup brands. I work for a trend company. Um, ever since Rihanna came out, it's, you know, a new celebrity line every six months is popping up and there's nothing bad, bad with it. Um, and some founded brands are JLo Beauty, Fenty, Rare, Human Race by Pharrell, Alicia Keys has a line. And there's even now dedicated manufacturing companies like Slate Brands who are incubators for celebrity based brands because it's such a huge trend right now. And it's taking a spin on the old celebrity endorsed fragrance deal and giving celebrities a bigger platform along with a bigger chunk of the business. Um, so I think marketing, you have to look at it like, are your products attractive consu to consumers today? And will these same products be attractive in five years? For me, when I look at celebrity and I think of certain marketing trends, I'm like, is today's celebrity going to have the same interest in beauty in five years as they do today? Um, another trend that's probably a little bit more boring is supply chain trend. Supply chain trends. They aren't spoken about, but they're silently there in the background. Um, your team is looking at different ways to improve your supply chain, whether it is working with small farms, ingredient, like ingredient vendors and labs, and even looking at like your sustainable and carbon footprint initiatives. I would say sustainability is supply chain led and then it's marketing driven at the end of the day. Um, another trend is going to be your seasonal trends. I touched on it before, but right now there is the Make believe makeup trend um, it was really inspired by Euphoria. You really are seeing more and more of it on Instagram and TikTok now. Um, you know, people are bored in COVID still. People are, you know, you can't go out and go to a bar or go to class or go to work and wear fun makeup anymore. So you have to you have to think of ways to entertain yourself at home. So brands like About Face and even Freck, which is a new smaller indie brand are, are launching and focusing more on that, that mindset. And then you also have trends that are like more minimalist, like Merit Beauty, where, you know, they, you only need a couple of products, um, but those are seasonal. I, you know, they could be lasting. We just don't know as developers at this point. And then the last trend, which will then take you into Maritza's part is ingredient innovation trends. I think these are the ones where your teams are researching and they're pushing the boundaries for the newest, coolest ingredients. Um, they're finding a way to make those like old, dirty formulas, as I like to call them, cleaner. Um, how do you make, you know, something that had beeswax in it before a vegan formula? How do you have the same quality? How can you make anything with red in it not include carmine to be uh, vegan. Um, and as developers, I think our goals are to find those new innovative ingredients before anyone else does. It's talking to the labs, it's talking to your friends in the industry to kind of see what they're doing and not like let them know what you're doing. Um, and also building on relationships with vendors is a great way for you to get ahead of trends because they're gonna show you what's new and exciting before they show anyone else. And, and I think that Maritza will have more to discuss on this topic, but I mean, in total, trends are gonna hit you from every point of view in your beauty career, um, whether you're on the development side, the marketing side, I mean, even on the education side, I think Everyone at a company has to be aware of what's on trend, always looking for something new, exciting, and then bringing it to the table so that your brand can really blossom and, and always stay on the map. The idea is you launch a brand, you launch a product, and you want it to have staying power. You don't want it to disappear in a year or two.
Thank you, Jack. Jackie, I really appreciate that. That's amazing. And there's already some questions in chat for you. So under Q&A, if you want to take a look at and try and answer some of those, that would be amazing. Great. So again, a first insight from Jackie, and now we're going to have Maritza step in. So, and, and it's a perfect segue, right? We're gonna go straight from which understanding the trends, understanding what's gonna be popular, but now really being able to take that and tie that to the story and find an ingredient that pays off that story, an ingredient that pays off that trend. Um, you know, so once you, you, you've got that, um, you, you, then you need to make sure that ingredient has the efficacy and the appeal that you need it to have. So here to guide you on how that works um, is gonna be Maritza and then, at the end, we're gonna we have the ingredients for you to be inspired by. Um, she's not talking necessarily those specifically, but think about that kind of thing as she goes through it. How you might use what she's inspiring you with to um, use an ingredient in your product. So, Maritza, it is all yours. Thank you. So, hello again, um, and thank you, Jackie, for walking us through the importance of trends in beauty. Um, so I'm going to be going over the big picture of ingredient stories and please, please, I love how interactive um, you guys have been um, during Jackie's. I would love for you guys to be just as interactive while I'm speaking. I'll go back and read them later. Um, so firstly, I guess, why do you guys think ingredients are so important? I want to know, like, put it in the chat. I'm going to give you, um, you know, a few, but please do put it in the chat. Um, and it's really because they help you create an overall product story. Um, for example, if you're thinking citrus, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Vitamin C and then brightening probably. Um, or if you see something with retinol, what do you think? Anti-aging, um, right? Or salicylic acid, your mind might go to acne. Um, caffeine, your mind goes to depuffing and like a wake up. Um, so like the list goes on and on and on, but it's, it's, you know, ingredient stories. They help just almost trigger, like, you just need to hear that. You don't even need to see the product and your mind is like, Ooh, I want that. Like I want brightening. Ooh, I want anti-aging. Um, I want it all really. But, um, so they're very important and they're, they're very powerful. Um, sometimes the ingredient inspires the product. So, oh my gosh, brightening, yes, let's make something bright, let's make a brightening primer. But sometimes a trend inspires a product, right? Um, like the example that Jackie mentioned earlier, the brow lamination, um, soap brows, that um, was a trend that inspired our brow glue at NYX. Um, but another one, like for instance, our one of our newest launches, the NYX Marshmallow Primer. So both actually trend and ingredient influenced um, that that development, and it was really looking at look at looking at your portfolio, which I won't get too much into because you'll hear a little bit about that later. But like, what do we want? Um, sorry, and the trend for this was the skinification, right? So skinification is a huge trend right now, where skincare and color are merging and you're almost getting color with like skincare benefits. So we took that trend, um, skinification and we created this primer. And we, when we were looking for unique ingredients, um, well, when we look at our portfolio and we see, okay, so this is where we have a gap in our portfolio. We can't do another mattifying. We can't do another hydrating. You know, we can't do another pore filling because we have that. So we wanted to create almost like this smoothing, soft touch vibe, but still with the benefits of skinification. So we chose mar marshmallow root extract. And the reason we chose this was because it's fun. If like you hear marshmallow and you think like fun, you think bouncy, you think, you know, like sweet, even though marshmallow root extract isn't that, it's not like the little things you pop in your mouth and, you know, are delicious. We thought it would really ties into the brand. So like you always have to think about what ingredients make sense with your brand. Um, not everything does um, and not everything, not all ingredients are necessarily credible to your brand. Um, so there we took marshmallow root extract, which is, you know, seen in skincare products, and we put it into our primer that helped tell a story on the overall, um, that ingredient helped tell a story on the overall um, product. Um, so there's different things that you need to look at. It's not just about the ingredient, it's the brand, it's, you know, everything. Um, so 
uh, that's, you know, why ingredient stories are important. It helps the overall product, which then I'll be moving into the next point. Um, what are things you need to consider when calling out ingredients? What do you guys think? Put it in the chat. But so what are these? This is the part where it gets, you know, a little trickier in product development. Like, what are things you need to consider? I mentioned one earlier, which is um, like, does it make sense for your brand to be calling out a certain ingredient? How is it authentic, right? But it's also the not so fun parts. It's legal claims. What does your marketing team want to say about this product? Can they say it based like with what you're developing? I'm talking from like a development uh, point of view, like does it make sense? Um, what they want to say, does your product deliver to that? But when you're putting, you know, with this skinification trend, let's say, when you're thinking ingredients and ingredient trends and ingredient stories, you can't necessarily say something smooths and, you know, because X, Y ingredient, if there's not efficacious levels of that ingredient. Um, now more than ever, consumers are so um, informed on like, what ingredients do, what are the no-nos, what, you know, different things. Like if it's at the top of an ingredient list, there's more of it in there. If there, if it's at the bottom, there's less of it in there. So you need to, you know, when developing, you need to know all this. You need to know what your marketing team wants to say. You need to check with legal if it's even allowed, because at the end of the day, you don't want to create a product and then get sued for what you're saying. And then of course, you need to make sure that when you send it out, for you know, consumer testing, claims testing, that it's actually going to perform to those. So you're testing it, you're using it, you're saying marshmallow root extract, and I keep using this as you know because it's a recent um, launch of ours. But marshmallow root, root extract extract helps um, with inflammation. It helps soften. So we need to make sure that we're just not. It's not all fluff. It's not you know. It actually performs to that. Um, so these are all the things you need to consider when you're thinking about an ingredient and what you're going to say about it and how it's going to perform. You know, all of that good stuff. I think I say sometimes it's not the fun part because it could get um, tricky. You know, putting things at efficacious levels sometimes gets expensive or putting things at efficacious levels if that percentage is too high, sometimes it interferes with the formula. Um, but, you know, it's all part of the development and it's all part of the story. Um, so next, where do we get inspiration from? Um, Jackie mentioned a few of these earlier, um, but we get inspiration from everywhere. At least um, I do, um, and I'm sure, <laughs> you know, everyone does. So WGSN, so forecasting companies, WGSN, Beauty Streams, Nally Rhodey. I know um, going to fit them, you have access to all of that, which are really expensive to buy. Like as a company to buy those, they're, you know, 10,000, 20,000, depending on how many users are allowed. So you do get this um, benefit while going to fit them, right, Tina? I hope you still do. When I did, you, <laughs> you got these benefits. Um, so it's really exciting because it allows you to look, you know, two, three, four years into the future on like what's going to be trending, what ingredients are being called out, um, what, you know, what do you see surfacing? Are there any new innovations that are coming up that are like new, 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 and they haven't hit, you know, cosmetics. Um, so looking at those forecasting websites is really helpful. Um, oh, and then also um, vendors. So you utilize your vendors a lot for, um, for like trend for sorry, ingredient info, like what are they seeing? Because they also have access to raw material vendors. So it's the stuff, the ingredients that you put into make the final product, they have access to them. And they're, um, they're always like coming out with new things, they're always getting presentations that necessarily us as product developers don't see. So asking them, like, what are you seeing? What are the new ingredients? What's the, what's the new it ingredient? Um, of course, so using social media as um, you know inspiration for ingredients. Like, what are people on TikTok using? Like homemade stuff. What you know are they using? I don't know a new oil. Um, so getting inspiration there. Like thinking as when you're in product development, you think like, oh, how do I put like how do I translate this into a product, right? Um, and then of course, Jackie mentioned this, but other industries, the food industry, the fashion industry, like taking a trend from their um, like runway and then 
putting it into something that's more wearable for every day that you can like create a product for your brand. So these are all the areas where, you know, you find inspiration. Um, the list goes on and on and on. Um, and lastly, um, what are current ingredients that you guys are seeing in the market today? Um, put it in the chat. A few of them, um, you know, vitamin C has been really popular today. Niacinamide, you know, you hear that being mentioned everywhere. Yes, HA, yes, VHA, all of those, all of those. Um, CBD, right? You see all of these, um, everything. Uh, but now, so we're seeing that now. And like to Jackie's point earlier, if you want to hop on that like trend, it's fine. You could, because these are great ingredients, whether they were, you know, last year's trend or two years ago, they're still great ingredients. But at the end of the day, like you're not going to be new, you're not going to be innovative. So you look at you know, your trend inspos um, and you find new ingredients like marshmallow root extract. It's not really in co color. It's more in skin. Um, but here on the screen, as you can see, I took from WGSN um more new ingredients that are going to be trending in the next couple of years so we have like cbn so that's the new cbd um it's claimed to be better than um cbd and more effective for anxiety insomnia and overall well-being so here you hear like okay you think ingestible right but they're gonna also start trending in color i'm Marissa. sure of that. <laughs> yes <laughs> I'm gonna have to cut you off, my oh, dear. <laughs> okay, so there you go. <laughs> I will. Um, you guys can tell she is totally passionate about this, and I oh, can tell where she's going with her ingredients. So, oh, yeah. I love it, you know. And I'm so sorry I had to butt no in worries. on you, but no I need to make sure we have time for everybody else as well. So, and I don't want you giving away all your new secrets. All right. So if you give away too many of your new ingredients, you know, but everybody keep your eye out for what's coming out in Nix's new products and you'll see. <laughs> right, so, Maritza, thank you so much. That was really great information. So now that we have trend and ideas of a story, we have to create the product. So I want to bring Kia on now and have her talk about, you know, the, the, the creating the product. There are so many elements. I think Kia's got the hardest job right here today because there are so many elements to product development that she was just looking at me not too long ago going, what on earth am I supposed to cut this down to 10 minutes? <laughs> and, and yeah, you were going to get less minutes if it ain't cut Maritza off. So, <laughs> there you go. so you've got, you know, I know it's uh, hard to cut it down into 10 minutes, but I'm, you're here. I know you can take on the challenge, Kia. So off you go. Um, enjoy. I mean, here, give everybody <laughs> your, your 10 minute version. of My 10 minute. <laughs> I know all of us are so passionate. Your whole you can career definitely see in 10 minutes. 10 minutes. <laughs> I know it's all of us are so passionate. You can definitely see it comes across even even virtually all on camera. Um, going from trends to ingredients, which is a great segue into product development with Maritza touched on very well in terms of some of the things we deal with on the daily basis. So here we go into product development. These are just top lines, a few things just to think of when you're looking at each of these categories. You definitely do deeper dives, but these are your top, like your top things that you really want to think about and can really guide you in the right direction to do your deeper dives. So what do you really want to create? And do you want this to be more ingredient driven? Do you want this to be more packaging driven? Are you really solving a problem? Are you filling a gap? Do you want to approve on something that's already in the industry that you're like, you know what? Yeah, that works. But I think I think it could be a little bit better. Or I think now that we're going in the direction of maybe different forms and things being sensorial, can I transition this into something else? Are you looking at a powder form, a liquid, a gel, a stick, a cream? Is this being presented on a gondola in Sephora where if it's a jar and people are putting their finger in it, is that really going to continue to represent your product well, or does it need to be airtight and will it dry out and how will you display it on the gondola? And these are just all things you really need to keep in mind. And then going in the direction of sensoriality and the overall look and how we all want to look on camera being virtual now, or have more nicer looking smoother skin. Uh, what is the finish? Do you want it to be matte, high shine, dewy, shimmer, natural, radiant? What are these key goals you're trying to achieve? And you really have to achieve that from 
concept and ideation. You really have to think what ingredients am I going to use? What texture is that going to be? What base do I really need to start with to achieve these goals? Next one, please, Heather. So going into um, continuing into other things that you want to think about. So for texture, these are just some top things, especially with sensoriality and Marissa touched on very well with marshmallows and thinking about the bounce and the fluff and those textures. You want it to be smooth, creamy, oily, buttery. You want people to touch your product and right away just be infatuated with what is this? How is this going to feel on my skin? You know, do I want to bathe in it? <laughs> and um, in tying to ingredients, it's what are your wish lists? What are the key benefits that you really want to achieve with this product? What is your free of list, such as your no-nos and your and your black list that you're moving away from, such as everybody going in the vegan direction? And how is this really compatible within your formula? Is it hydrophilic or lipophilic? Can, do you want immediate or do you want long-term results? If somebody such as a color cosmetic like Smashbox, yes, we do want products that you immediately can apply it and see an immediate reaction because when you're putting on your makeup for the day, you wanna immediately feel more confident, feel happier, really achieve your look, but then you also want these nice, good for you ingredients that as you continue to wear this product, that you're going to have your skin feeling nice. You're not going to have all of a sudden your pores seem like they're larger because you're putting too much product on them. And then your shade assortment. This is big, especially with inclusivity and diversity. You really want to check with your marketing team and really figure out how many SKUs are we going to launch? Is this going to be a shaded or a universal item? Where are your colors falling? Do you want your top wearables? Do you want your trendy? Is it a foundation? Is it more of a fun color item? Or is it a skincare product, which of course usually is unshaded? And really make sure you have that full assortment. Next, please, Heather. I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do my 10 minutes. So I'm trying to be good. Uh, so how will it be packaged? So are you looking at a jar, a compact, a tube, a bottle, a vial with an applicator? And how will your product really get the best performance in terms of the dispension with the pairing of this packaging? If you have something that feels really, really sensorial in a jar, you have to think, if I put this in a tube and I dispense it out of a tube, is this still going to have the same sensoriality? Am I still going to get the same efficacious type of level of performance between feeling the, the payoff, how it really applies, the dry down to it? And, and then you start considering what are my options here? An example is this cream eyeshadow that we just launched at the beginning of this year. We had to put it in this ophthalmolic tip tube that you see in the image because we want it to be a multi-use product, which means we couldn't have any suck back. So this specific type of tip makes it so that you dispense the product, it doesn't go back in the tube and you can use it on your cheeks, your eyes as eyeliner, on your eyebrows. And so we wanted this one on the go product that really stays clean and, sanit and sanitized and doesn't get any type of anything that was on your skin to go back into the tube. So how does this really fit your identity in terms of your packaging? Is it the texture of the package, the color of it, the shape of it, the decoration of it? We all can recognize NARS's really nice soft matte finish compacts and designs. We all know that Fenty's is that hexagon kind of beige uh, shade and we know that like rare beauty is all about the shapes of it for people with arthritis those are things that you want to keep in mind to really stay on track with the brand and then now everybody's moving in the sustainable direction so do you want to be sustainable is this really direction that you're going and how do you want to approach this from your brand's point of view and really make sure that as an industry we're all going in the direction to make it a better place while looking beautiful right it's all of our goal so key features and benefits. We've talked about ingredients. Vegan is now no longer just something that is only for your demographic, but it's something that everybody really is trying to achieve by removing the carmine, removing the beeswax like Jackie talked about. How do we still get these efficacious levels? How do we still get this performance? Is it natural, cruelty-free, fragrance-free? Do you have a specific type of special applicator or packaging that maybe 
outperforms specifically the ingredients and that's something you want to focus on more because that's the highlight of the product. Does it help achieve a new trend and a new look that you're trying to go for or something that you really are trying to get the best performance? And then the last thing is really thinking about how does this tie into your brand image, which all of us have consistently kind of talked about. Is it is your brand have a social responsibility? Is it trendy? Is it natural? Is it edgy? And you really have to think to yourself, what, why is this a need for your brand? Why is this a need for the industry? Why would your consumer want this? And how will you be able to convey the purpose of this item and bring it into the market? And why now? Because we always have to think ahead. And Jackie touched on that very well. It's if you're looking at something right now, it's already too late. I mean, everything that's launching now, all of us have worked on basically a year ago. So how do you continue to improve that and to keep going forward and really be innovative along the way? So the next I think we're gonna, did I do it in 10 minutes? Did I do okay? You team? did, you did it so much. I was like, wait a minute, I'm so fascinated. She's done, what happened? <laughs> there's, so much, there's so much in product development that That's is definitely so just an overview. Um, the other alums did very well in terms of touching on theirs that helped to seg my, segue mine in a little bit better. <laughs> you know, you know, you did a great job. I mean, obviously it's your passion and it's what you love and, and we know you, you know, there's so much more to this than what you even touched, but what you gave them as a guide is such a great window. So I truly appreciate that Kia. All right. And I know there's a ton Thank of questions you. in the Q and A for you. So have some fun trying to answer all those. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So now I'm going to bring on in, um, Caitlin. So, you know, again, um, where am I? Um, you know, so it, there's so much to consider and decide, right? And so you've got, we've gone through the ingredients and we've gone through the packaging and we've gone through the trends. And of course, now we're at the final step, right? And the final step is the messaging and your positioning and getting it out there. And, you know, you can create the most amazing product in the world and no one may ever find it unless you know how to make sure they do. So um, we're gonna let Caitlin give you a little insight into some of the ways that she and her brands, especially considering that you know she was part of launching a brand new brand with Petite and Pretty. Caitlin has some really amazing insights on how to even get that started. So off you go, Caitlin. All right, I'm hoping I get this done in 10 minutes. Pressure's on. Good job to everybody that went before me. Uh, like Tina said um, and mentioned earlier, so I teach the fundamentals of cosmetics class and I am a product developer. I helped launch the brand Petite and Pretty. And for those of you don't, who don't know, because I am going to use it as an example for a couple of my slides, Petite and Pretty was one of the first, we were the first prestige beauty brand for children, tweens and teens. So I'll be using it as an example for some of my slides today on how we created the brand and how to really launch a successful brand and successful product. Because like everybody's mentioned, the market for cosmetics is so saturated right now. Brands are launching left and right. New products are coming out nonstop. So how do you take all of the time that you've taken to you know, really research your trends and figure out what you're doing and pick the right ingredients and then figure out what's the best formula to bring it out in? And how are you gonna design a really cool, really innovative package to deliver the product to the consumer? What, what are you going to do once you've done all of these different things? How are you ultimately gonna sell it to the consumer? Um, my background is in product development, but because I was able to help start this brand, I've been lucky enough to be able to work across all departments in marketing and product development and mer visual merchandising, operations, social media, and in finance. So when starting a brand, one of the ends when you're launching product, one of the biggest things that you need to tackle is your brand voice and your brand story. Who is your brand? What is their story? Are you, like Jackie mentioned earlier, is it trend driven? You know, are you going to be one of those brands like, you know, Color, Pop Cosmetics, Morphe, they're constantly partnering with different influencers. They're partnering with like Frozen from Disney. They're doing, you know, short collaborations that are always on trend, always colorful, always fun. Are you makeup artistry driven? You know, Makeup by Mario, he did Kim Kardashian's makeup and then he, you know, launched himself as a makeup brand and he's the face of his brand. Are you performance based? Are you going to be all about long wearing? Are you going to be a brand that has really high coverage and performance and can cover tattoos? Are you going to be everything's waterproof? Is everything in your line going to have SPF? Is it going to be sun care? Do you want to have a performance-based product? 
Um, and then another one is, are you filling a gap in the market? Are you solving a problem? When Petite and Pretty launched, you know, we went back and forth with what kind of brand were we going to start when I was sitting with my founder? And we thought, you know, there's nothing on the market right now for children and tweens that's in the prestige arena that's geared for you know, your girls and boys that are starting to wear makeup for the first time that's really theirs and that's safe and that parents know that they can really turn to and trust and what can we build into the brand that's going to allow them to trust it. So really knowing who your brand is and what it stands for and who they are at the end of the day and what you're going to be able to use through all of the products that you launch is incredibly important. And another thing with your brand, knowing who your brand is, is who is your customer? This is probably one of the most important things that you will need to figure out is who your customer is. And this is something that in my class I teach over and over and over. I think I mentioned it in every lecture that we had every week is it always comes back to the customer. You need to know who your customer is because if you spend all this time developing this product, creating this amazing brand, but you don't know who your customer is and you can't speak to them effectively, it's not going to be successful and you'll have wasted all of this, all of your time and energy that you've spent in it. So one of my favorite ways to teach this is what is your customer like? You know, give your customer a name or your customers. If you have multiple customers, give them a name. How old are they? What do they care about? Are they passionate about, you know, are you socially responsible? Are they, you know, very concerned with makeup artistry? Do they really want to make sure the product performs? Um, and how are you going to speak to them in an effective way? When we started Petite and Pretty, you know, we realized we have two customers. We have the user who's, you know, 12, 13, 14, and then could also be like a younger sibling in the five, six, seven, eight range, but they're not the ones buying the product. So while we have to appeal to the younger age groups that they want to buy the product, we also have to appeal to the parent or the grandparent or the aunt and uncle or the friend or whoever's actually going to buy the product, because we all know 12 year olds, you know, most 12 year olds, not all the influencers that my company works with, they don't have an income. So how are they going to buy the product? So we have to know that who our customer is so that we can speak to them effectively so that they want to buy the product and that they will buy the product. Another thing is the product positioning to the customer. So what drives your product? Like you've heard in the presentations before me, it could be the ingredient. Is the ingredient the most important part of the product that you're developing? Or is it the packaging? Or is it, is it you know, going to speak to a trend, a new upcoming trend? You know, or does your customer really care about like, you know, what's not in it, that it's clean or that it's high performance, that it's long wearing. Um, an example that I'll give for Petite and Pretty is when we launched our mascara, we did a lot of research, you know, it's what's going to be that right, perfect first mascara for 12, you know, for kids when they're starting to wear it. And we actually learned that the average child's eye size is two millimeters smaller than the adult before it's fully grown. So we took the top selling hourglass volume shaped, you know, traditional mascara one, and we actually tooled it to be two millimeters smaller so that it perfectly fits their eye shape so that they have a really easy application. It's comfortable for them and it's just a natural fit. So packaging can drive, you know, drives a lot of the product at my brand. And it can also be something that drives, you know, what your what the products that you guys are creating for this TikTok. Um, and ultimately at the end of the day, how are you, how are you going to communicate this product to the consumer? When you guys are thinking of the products that you're creating for this assignment and you are figuring out on TikTok, how you're going to, you know, film it in the, in the short snapshot that you have, you need to think of, you know, who's your customer? How are you going to speak to them? I know Tina mentioned this. It's in the actual written instructions. You know, you're not going to sell a product that's meant for someone that's, you know, 50, the same way that you would sell if it was meant for someone that was 25 to someone that was 12 and coming to my brand. You know, how are you, how are you going to speak to them and speak their language and speak in a way that really resonates with them? And how are you going to pick what's most important about the product that you're developing? You know, are you going to show, is it, you know, by showing the swatches, is it by talking about the ingredients or is it more important to show the product and put little cliff notes on the side of what the product does or what's in the ingredient? It's really important. I think that when you guys are creating brands and when you guys are creating these products that you really have a strong understanding of who your company is, who is the brand that you're making? What is the product that you're creating and how are you going to speak to the product to your consumer? Because you want to create, a, you are obviously going to create a product that you want, like the must have, I wish this existed in real life because I'd buy it tomorrow. And how are you going to share that passion with the consumer so that they feel the same way and they want to buy all of the products that you have made? I think that was my 10 minutes. You're doing the same exact thing to me that Kia did to me. How do you guys do this? 
I'm like, wait, I'm so enwrapped and so engaged. And then you just finish. So that way to make the hostess look like she doesn't have the most stiffs. What can I tell you? <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Oh my God. You know, I obviously um, work with you guys all the time and I've been in the industry a long time. And yet listening to this is just, it's, I get so excited hearing you guys tell your stories and tell your vision and tell your insights. So I kind of want to enroll in my own program all over again. All right. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Caitlin. I super appreciate it. And I'll have you come back in a few minutes. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to shift a little bit and I'm going to introduce you to two of our current students. Um, so if I can get Anna and Rachel to turn on their cameras and join me, that would be amazing. Um, there you are, ladies. All right, welcome. So both Anna and Rachel are in the program currently, and we thought what would be an awful lot of fun to do would be to have them take on the same challenge that we're giving you, and for you to be able to see a little bit of what they did, and then, you know, watch their videos, and then also um, I'm going to ask them a few questions about their experience, but let me introduce you to them. So Rachel is, um, Rachel Kwan uh, is actually in the Bachelor of Science and Beauty Business Management. She did finish the AA in Beauty Marketing Product development. So we divide the program into two separate chunks, the AA first and then the Bachelor of Science section second. So Rachel finished the one and now she's in the, the Bachelor of Science program. She is a really great student. I'm very proud of her. And she has this really awesome, amazing, fun, creative side. And you're actually going to see that in her TikTok. We did not, all we did was hand these two students the challenge and say, do it. And they took very, very different approaches, um, which is perfect because that's what the industry does. Every brand takes a super different approach to the way that they market and sell their brands. So I also want to introduce you to Anna. Anna is actually finishing up her AA in beauty marketing product development, and I'm arm twisting her to continue. And um, she's actually part of our prestige beauty circle as well, which is the students who have um, a GPA of 3.80 and above. And Rachel has also been part of that program. So. Anna has a little more of an analytical mind and I think more of a marketing um, focus and product focus mind. So she took a very different approach than Rachel. So what I'm going to do first is have you, we're going to watch both of your videos, just one back to back, and then let's um, have you guys talk about the experience and I'll ask you a few questions. So whenever we're ready to cue those up. Hi everyone, my name is Anna and this is my product, Luz do Sol Glow Probiotics. Luz do Sol translated from Portuguese, sunlight. People are spending more time inside of their homes on this pandemic time, also between fall and winter, which makes them lose the sun kiss a glow. Research are showing that it has increased in irritated skin and acne, caused by stress and anxiety because of the pandemic time. I mean, who cannot relate to that, right? Glow Probiotic is for all skin types. It's a probiotic infused oil with living lactobacillus that improves the skin barrier function, reduces acne, redness, while gives a golden glow to the skin. Trend ingredients of this product is the probiotic of lactobacillus that is fermented from pitch, which is a friendly bacteria that will boost the health of your skin microbiome. The other trend ingredient is the Tiony Galactic Gold, an ultra glittery metallic like gold effect. Okay, so that was it and his approach. So now let's take a look at um, Rachel's approach. And Rachel has quite the Instagram, I mean, TikTok following. So you guys need to follow her on there. I think Anna's going to start. Oh, technical difficulty. All right. So, um, and here we go. Or maybe not. You know, as soon as I start talking, the video will work. Well, what we're going to do is, <laughs> while she tries to get the video queued up, let me just talk to Anna. Anna, I'll just say then, or Heather, are you ready? Hi, everyone. My name is... Nope, that's Anna again. All right, so I will let Heather tell me in the background when she's ready. In the meantime, I'm going to ask Anna a question. So Anna, what was that like for you to do that? I mean, I just threw the video at you out of the background, you know, and you created this. And you said you admitted you're not a big TikTok user, right? Yes, correct, Latina. I am not a TikTok girl. <laughs> that was my first video, actually. And I had a lot of fun, to be honest. 
to create that. Uh, the product, the brand, the video, it was amazing, actually. I was amazing because I didn't imagine that I could do. I couldn't even think, of, oh, I could do that because um, I'm millennial. I'm <laughs> and the millennials, I don't know if you, some of you guys are millennials. We are not too much on TikTok, more on Instagram, but I really love doing this challenge. Awesome. All right, cool. I think we're ready for it. Rachel. We're going to give it a shot so we can see hers. Are you ready? All right. Did you bring the goods? Polaris by Nanoland is a facial gel with the main ingredient being chai on Astro White. Made with full mica, Astro White gives Polaris an amazing glitter-like effect without the environmental concerns of PET glitter, bringing a whole new set of glitter possibilities. Okay, so for those of you who are thinking you were going to figure out exactly what to do by watching their videos, guess what? I hope we've confused you <laughs> because they were so different and they're both so amazing. So Rachel, what was it like for you to do that project the way we, we gave it out to you? I mean, you're going to get it the same way everybody else is on here. Yeah, I think, again, like Anna mentioned, it was a lot of fun just filming it as well. And I did bring a friend into it to help me film. And I think that was also what made it so fun because we were laughing the whole time. It took us like 30 minutes for that 60 second shot just because we were having so much fun. And I think what's also very important is if you were on the app before, if, you're, if you've been on the app for a while, your For You page is what, it changes to what you interact with. So what you always see isn't what's trending per se, it's just because you interact with those stuff more. So like mentioned previously, I think it's also important not just to look at your For You page, but to actually research on trends to make sure what you're seeing is what is trending or like the future trends as well. Yeah, and, and you're also, I mean, obviously the two of you would be targeting very different audiences too as well, right? I mean, the way that you've positioned your outreach and the way you speak to it is going to get very different consumers. And so, you know, one style is going to attract one certain type of personality and another style, obviously, you know, you're going to be on their page attracting what interests them. So I think that's super important as well, right? Um, you know, any advice, so you'd said, you know, any advice sort of from the student perspective, from your perspective of uh, when you were handed this project, how, what advice would you give um, the people who are going to participate in this challenge on how to attack it by giving this ingredient? Where did you even start? Well, I think um, when looking at the ingredients, I, since I already have a following, I specifically looked at what the people that I follow would like the most. And um, I think that's kind of also important when you are a brand because you have to market towards your consumer, you're not marketing towards a whole new consumer. And so I looked at the products that I would like as a consumer myself, like what would I want? What would my friends want? Because those are the people that follow me, they're like me. So I try to also think of it as a consumer point of view as something that I would want to purchase. Great. All right, what about you, Anna? I think um, mostly it's looking online, you know, on social media, what is out there, what's going on in market and what people want, what, what people are looking for and the trends and forecasting is very, all the marketing itself is pretty much you're searching. You're searching every day to new things. And I, the, the thing that I will say for it, you know, the people who try to do this challenging is definitely do what you most like. I like skincare, so that's why I went for skincare because it's easier to do things that you like most. So go on that direction. Okay, all right. And uh, any, you know, any, what's been your favorite sort of part you've learned at FITM so far? And how did you feel you brought that into your video? Product development. Definitely. There's a whole, right? Well, here. She was my teacher. Love her. I learned a lot of her. All right. Rachel, what about you? What's been your favorite learning and how did you bring it into your video? I think also product development, like Anna mentioned, but also just 
knowing that I have the resources to look at trends and look at future trends because of what FITM provides us. Like I have access to WGSN and I think that's really helpful. And it's a lot of fun to see what the future will bring as well. All right, awesome. All right, well, thank you both, all right? I'm gonna send you into the background, but please get onto that. Oh, everybody's hitting you up on Insta and everything. So get into that chat, give them your info, get into the Q&A and answer some of these. There's some very student-centered questions that I think would be very much best answered by you rather than, you know, they don't believe us. So um, hit that. And so anybody who has a question specifically for Anna or Rachel, put it into the question. If it's specific for them in the Q&A, put their name, they'll find it quicker. Um, and of course, you've got your, in, your, your chat going as well. And so ladies, um, stay in the background here. And in the meantime, I'm gonna bring back my four panelists, please. Okay, so we have got, you know, some really good time for Q&A going right now. Um, and, you know, we've really put a, quite a big chunk of time for, against this because we think it's that's what, what everybody here attending today wants, right? So some of you are going to have questions on the challenge. Some of you are just going to have questions, as I can already tell, just for each of the panelists here. So um, we, I'll pull some out of the Q&A, but also we'll put them in. Did any of you catch any of the questions in the Q&A that you want to address specifically right now, or shall I start dragging some up? I can bring some up. All right, hold on then. Let me drag some questions out of the Q&A for you and we'll just start that way, right? Um, well, first of all, everybody wants your Instagrams. So did you put your Instas on that into chat? If you would, if you're willing to like triple your following. Um, so everyone is asking for that, please. All right. Um, so think what we have a question from Gabby and and it's something that's kind of really come to the surface during the whole um, pandemic and obviously with everything changing in our society and it's what incentives or programs are all of your brands doing to help black owned makeup brands or you know like where do you feel the future is for you know more of the diverse brands in the market or not even that diverse consumers how are you guys um you know, focusing or are you shifting at all? Is it just been in your DNA the whole time? How do we deal with this multicultural market that that we're facing? Anybody? Okay, Marissa. Yeah, I mean, um, as far as like Nix, I feel like we've been, you know, having we like inclusive models before it was, you know, trending. Um, also leadership, like who we employ, we're a very diverse team. Um, and that's kind of always been part of the DNA. You have, you know, all races, all genders, um, religions. And I feel like that also that's reflected in our development. So like making sure one, like for instance, in foundation, we're very inclusive even in our color, like making sure our shadows show up on all skin types, making sure the lip pops on all skin types, not just one. Um, and I mean, you can go on our Instagram now and you could see there's like people of all colors, all genders. Um, so I feel really proud to be part of a brand that has always had, you know, this type of representation and been very inclusive, but not just in what we show and how we develop, but also like as part of like a team, we're very, like, we're so diverse in the team. Um, so yeah, I yeah, think we'll I think that's a big part, right? That Diversity in the team that. itself. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, a question that came up, right? How did you kind of dealing and any of you can take this one. I mean, it was an ingredient focused, so um, we can do that. But how would you handle a hero ingredient that people are generally familiar with? So when, when you've come up with a new ingredient, something different and exciting that you're really thrilled about, you know, maybe um, I'll throw this one to Kia. If you're really thrilled about it and you guys are super excited about it and you know you've got all this science and technology in there, how do you get that across? Because you're going to get, you know, I mean, Smashbox has a great reputation as artistry, but not, how do you explain all of a sudden we're talking technology and science? It's definitely, it's definitely translating it through the product from base all the way up till the end and really making sure that ingredient really pairs well with it in terms of, okay, if this is an adaptogen, 
how are we going to speak to that in the transition of your product throughout the days? Like we used a similar one in one of our balancing primers, which was a snow mushroom, which is an adaptogen. And that one helps you to really, really absorb oils where you have excess oil, but not dry out your skin. So how do we get this across in an item or a certain product that you were going to wear all day? You want it to be good on your skin. You don't want your skin to dry out but you don't want to look oily. So how do we figure out an ingredient to balance that? And that's where a snow mushroom can come in. And that's how we can tie it to like our hybrid where it's an in-between of like a cosmetic and a skincare where we're not telling you to have our primer replace your skincare. We're saying use this primer in addition to your skincare to make your makeup look great and to do all these extra things for you. And it's just finding that little tie-in as a brand and how it works also in like at the photo studio and on set with our artist. Cool. Excellent. A lot of questions are kind of coming up about vendors and where you guys find your vendors and how do you um, qualify a vendor and how do you, and, you, and obviously we have a lot of people in here, it's smaller brands. How do you find a vendor that's willing to work with a small brand? Maybe Caitlin, since you launched a small brand recently, <laughs> maybe you want to take that one on. Yeah. So that's a great question, especially if you do have small brands, because there is this thing called minimum order quantities. And if you don't pick the right manufacturers, you can get stuck with, you know, minimum order quantities that could be 5,000, 10,000. And you have to consider how long is it going to take to sell that product before you can reorder that product. So there are actually, because there's in the last couple of years, all these indie brands have been popping up. So there's startups left and right all on the West coast is where the majority of indie brands are happening all of the big manufacturers are racing to try to figure out how can they speak to the indie brands? How can they do lower order quantities and really service the startups? There's a couple different vendors that are actually, that have just come up in the last couple of years that are based down in you know, Southern California that are for startups and they have really low order quantities so that small brands can order with them and be able to afford it and be able to actually sell it through in a proper time. Um, I think there's multiple ways that you can find vendors. So you can either, you know, I, I wrote in the, I answered, I think this question, you can actually, you know, go to trade shows. So trade shows aren't really happening right now because of COVID, but when they come back, there are trade shows like makeup in Los Angeles, makeup in New York, Cosmoprof is held all throughout the US, all throughout the world. So attending trade shows is where, you know, you're gonna find formula manufacturers, component manufacturers, everybody's gonna come together and show you what they're working on, what the new trends are, what new formulas, products, packaging. Um, you can also Google them, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes, you, you know, if you're just looking for manufacturers, you can start Googling and kind of see where it takes you. Um, I also recommend subscribing to trade publications. Um, beauty packaging is a great pu trade publication that talks all about, you know, components and is dedicated to the beauty industry for the manufacturing side. Um, so I think, you know, Googling trade publications is a good way to follow it as well. And then going to fit them. If you come to FITM, you'll learn about how all the different ways that you can develop product. You'll hopefully take my class and we'll teach you all the different ways that you can go about not only finding the right vendors, but how you even start the process of developing a product. Great. Definitely. And I put in there too in the chat that HAPPI is a great magazine, online magazine that has an amazing directory of vendors as well. So you can go there. Um, Jackie, I'm going to throw to you sort of the same type of question, but again, focusing really on trends. A lot of it now not everybody's going to have access to, you know, all of the databases that we, we bring, but how does, how do you find trends if you're not going down the WGSN Nelly Rohde super expensive database route, right? I mean, I think it, it's kind of like what Caitlin said, like you really have to, like, for me, it's talking to vendors, but if you don't have that vendor database, while the trade shows aren't happening in person, a lot of them are doing virtual trade shows. So they have a lot of webinars. You know, I had a webinar yesterday about sustainability, doing as much as you can to understand what the vendors are looking at. Um, Happy is a good publication. I follow beauty packaging. I get the emails every single day and I'm reading them. I'm, I'm seeing what's new and who's promoting what. Um, I do a lot of LinkedIn searches as well. I think it's, you know, it's underutilized for what it is. And I'm always on Instagram and, and TikTok because that's what my coordinator at my last job ta ta taught me to look at now. Yeah. So it's just kind of looking at where, who's doing what. Um, and I think you can't, you can't underestimate also the baby boomers. Someone yeah. asked that in the chat. And while everyone loves to say that's such a boomer thing, they have the most money. They are still the biggest population. They have that income that 
Gen Zers and even millennials don't have. They're spending more on it than, um, than other categories. So let's ask each one of you, where do you get, so something other than Pat, any kind of inspiration, where do you find your own personal inspiration from? So not a vendor, but where do you, do you go to a mag, personally magazine? Do you go to food websites? Do you go to TikTok? Do you go to vacation? You know, what do you, what do you, each of you do to be inspired? Because you're all, you're all, you're all in product development, right? So how do you get your own personal inspiration for your job? What do you do? Is it, you meditate? I'll go for, I mean, uh -huh. I'm going to be a bit backwards because I'm at it. We're a children's brand. So for me, you know, it's been really interesting and fun challenge at Petite and Pretty. We've had to rethink product development. So it's no longer is that for us trending and on trend and some, you know, the next biggest thing it's if you're 12 years old and this is the first experience that you're having, how can we make it the best experience? So our favorite thing to do when we sit in product development meetings, marketing meetings, social meetings, any meeting in our office is to say, okay, pretend you're 12, what does it feel like? And what is, what would you, what do I wish I had when I was 12? That's how I get inspiration is, I remember when I started wearing makeup and I feel like that's a powerful memory for everybody is their first makeup experience, whether it was on your own or you did it with your mom, dad, grandma, or your friends or however you first started wearing makeup. My inspiration is how could I have enhanced my first experience? What would I wish was available when I was that age first wearing makeup? So that's from our brain. Okay. All right, Kia, what about you? Where do you get your personal personal inspiration? For me, it's anywhere, anytime. I could see a flower and be like, that would be an amazing eyeshadow. I could see a t-shirt and be like, I need that in a lipstick. I can like feel a texture of something when I'm shopping or when I'm eating, how we all talk about fashion and food and be like, this would be an amazing texture somehow. And like even a highlighter or an eyeshadow. And it's always using your surroundings for inspiration and then also trying to solve kind of a need like what do you apply and what do you put on every day that you're like I just wish I had this one item or this one product and then also in this industry of course going to trade shows and things like that you also can meet with raw material suppliers which is all the way back to like the beginning, beginning step where you can meet these raw material suppliers, you can see what are the new scientific innovations and what's really going to be coming to the market and how will you use those ingredients and those raw materials that you're going to see transition to your manufacturers and how are you going to be able to formulate with those ingredients and then translate that to your brand. Yeah. Perfect. You must be fun when be back when we used to be able to go out to dinner. You, you, mm -hmm. I, <laughs> it's, you'd be great. <laughs> yeah. It, well, people that like beauty enjoy. People that don't like beauty are like, Kia, you need to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jackie, Maritza, you got anything you want to add to that? I totally agree with what Kia said. Like, really, anywhere, any place, anything, like, can really trigger something that is inspiring um, and that can translate into a product. So, yeah, agree with that. I mean, me personally, for a packaging perspective, I look at like the food industry. I think they're really ahead of the trend when it comes to sustainability. And that's one of my passions is figuring out what's actually going to be sustainable. You know, is that that vegan leather, is it actually something that is worthwhile or is it actually harming the environment? Are there other ways to get that same material? So I have something really cool and like cactus leather. It's like, well, it, it's cool, but also is it taking away from like the agave production in Mexico? Like, are, is it needed for something else more for like the food industry? Kind of thinking about, about it broadly. Yeah. So since each of you are in a llama fit him, right? Would you say the job you're doing is what you thought you would be doing when you were at school? Like, did you have any idea? No. <laughs> no, I will say that you definitely, I will say the biggest thing is one, you definitely learn how to network. Like I feel like FITM students and any FITM alum, like you learn how to network and that's key in this industry is definitely a big one. And then doing group projects because you're always going to deal with somebody challenging in the workplace, whether that be that they're super over opinionated, whether that be them not wanting to put in as much work on their end and you have to reach your, you know, your deadlines and you have to get the project done. And we're all adults, we're all in the workplace and it's really learning how to work with a variety of personalities and just get the job done without taking it personal and really just knowing how to deal with sometimes 
some big some big challenges. <laughs> and I you so love that you project. said that because yeah. every student's biggest complaint to me is like, why are there so many group projects? And I'm always like, oh, just wait till I get an alum to talk to you. You'll learn mm -hmm. that this is like your <laughs> great in the workplace. Right? Those people they follow you to the workplace. <laughs> you. Yeah, even Caitlin tells the story right in class, Caitlin, about how there's some people you have not, you've told your, you know, various companies not to hire because you know what they were like in your groups at school, right? Yep. So if you come to fit them and I tell my students this, when you come to fit them and you're in your group projects, remember that one day, one of your group, one of your group members might, you know, they might persuade if you get that job or not in the future. They could be whoever is at the company that you're applying to. Um, and when I went to fit them, you know, I will give, you know, Tina huge credit and the whole department for beauty. It wasn't like what it is now. So we didn't actually have a product development class when I was at fit them, like a full product development class. So I graduated thinking I wanted to do marketing and that was actually what my first job was. And then it was partway through that I realized product development was more my route. So I think, you know, if I went to fit them now, product development would probably be exactly what I want to do. And I would know that. So I think now the majors and the different classes that you take at fit them will really help prepare you and kind of help you figure out like what department you want to go into or what areas you want to explore, because they really do go into depth in each little, each area of, you know, building a brand and having different departments and the fit them program. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Jackie, that's one thing I was like, you know, we talked about trends and ingredients and PD and marketing. I mean, the companies you've worked for, because you're working for some smaller startups right now, right? Yeah. Where, um, how, did, how do your companies separate that? And were you surprised by that when you got out into the industry? And, you know, you, you specialize, but not every brand yeah. does. So not everyone, every brand does. When I left FITM, I thought I was going to be in marketing. I mean, my first job was customer service just to get my foot in the door. Kia was the... PD and packaging coordinator at Stila at the time. Like I left and Caitlin was at Stila. So we all crossed paths. Um, but at about, about face and at house, a lot of the functions cross over. So you have to be willing to put on different hats. Like while I love packaging and the technical side, I'm still helping the, the teams place POs and approve invoices and track those samples and put bottom labels on things. Um, and it's, it's a shock. Like, I think if you go from FITM to a bigger corporation, like an Estee Lauder, you're definitely going to be trained to do that one function, which is great. Love, love, people love to do one function. I think that starting out in like a startup or even on the manufacturing side, you see how much is needed to actually develop and launch a product. You have more respect for it. Um, and you, you then also see like what functions you want to pursue. If I started at a startup, I would probably still be on the path of packaging. I just get a little bit nerdy. I like love looking at drawings and I love talking to vendors about capabilities and being like, why can't you do this? This other vendor is doing it. So you should be able to do it too. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it's, you know, you leave fit them and you, you just have to have like an openness to trying different things out. If you know marketing is it and like you are great at that, that's great. Like I can tell in my packaging class, some people are I can see it in them. Like, I'm like that one girl's like really good at like doing, like helping with drawings and doing creative briefs and like loves talking technical with me. So. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. Um, so Maritza's dog had the zoomies. So she had to go off screen for a little bit. So welcome back Maritza. <laughs> it's like crazy. I'm like, why now? <laughs> you eat your treat. Hey, it happens. Don't worry. Let me ask this kind of, um, you know, we've had a few questions about people that are curious, you know, they everybody here is pretty much a beauty junkie who's attending this. And some of them have come at the world from that of an esthetician or a cosmetologist or from, you know, the love of applying makeup and, and, you know, that. So I know like Kia, you have your license. Um, the, the, you guys don't, right? Maritza and Jackie and Caitlin, you didn't grow up, you didn't do that, right? But how much do you think that, I mean, we don't teach that at Fit and we don't teach technique or application or, you know, license for cosmetology. But, you know, we teach passion, right? So, and, and you have to bring that passion. How much do you think the technical skill is needed to do what you do? How much do you think it's helped you? Or do you, how much, or do you think it hasn't hurt you at all? Um, um, oh, go ahead. You yeah, go you ahead. go because you have your license and then Maritza will have you answer. Um, I would say for me, it's beneficial because then I can talk across different avenues based off of technique 
And there are still a lot of things that I had to learn for technique in terms of cosmetology, also like legally, how you're allowed to apply things, the proper process, the chemicals behind it. And you do learn some of those basics. I don't think it's a make or break. I think it's a nice to have. So it's not something that I feel like you absolutely have to have, but I, I love having it. And I feel like certain things like that, that can just differentiate you and pull your resume out of the top of that stack. It's just something cool to have that I can say, oh, I'm a cosmetologist, I'm a makeup artist. And then also being a developer it ties that I know how to use the products. I also have a, tech, a little bit of a technical background on how to apply chemicals and things like that. So it kind of gives you a bit of a niche, but definitely not a must have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, well, then it's, I'm going to segue the question a little bit, Marissa. Why don't you ask the question, what would you say then is something when you, you know, I mean, you're the director, when you hire people now. So a lot of the people on here, you know, they're like, how do I get a job? I want to get into beauty. What do you look for? What are the skill sets you're hoping to have someone come work for you, Marissa? Yeah. I mean, one is passion, right? One thing is getting the resume and reading like what you've done as far as like jobs you've held, where you went to school, do you have fit on? But also it's like, when you get that interview, when you get that call, like your passion, your knowledge of the beauty industry, your knowledge of trends, because you don't need WGSN, right? To know trends. You don't need, these are really expensive. You could, um, you know, be watching YouTube. You could be on Instagram. You could have ideas that also trigger just like, um, you know, Key and I both said, we get ideas from everywhere. So that doesn't, you don't have to be at a brand or you don't have to have WGSN. So that's what I look for. I look for the passion, um, like when they're talking about product development or when they're interviewing um, and how like badly you could tell they want it, but like in a just like passionate way. And also like, yeah, how do you see trends? Like you don't have to know everything about marketing. You don't have to know everything about product development, but the drive. Um, I, I feel for me, that's how, you know, somebody is going to just like be a rock star, um, in the product development team. And I will say just to add to that, I mean, product development is so niche that you really have to have the heart and the passion for it, because there's so much you have to deal with, with it on a daily basis that you can't even explain some of the things that we have to deal with on a regular basis. And that passion and that love for it is what keeps you going through those hard times and through that bad stuff. And if you don't have the passion and the love for it, when those hard days come, you're ready to, you're ready to throw in the towel. <laughs> so and it's like the thing. passion is what keeps you motivated. And, I'll add to that and kind of go back to what was something that Jackie mentioned earlier that I feel like is so important. Um, just because you're in product development and let's say you're a coordinator or a manager, that doesn't necessarily mean that all you're going to do is play with color and IDA. There are things that you're going to have to do that you're not going to like that. It's, you're going to be like, well, this is not what I thought product development was, but it is part of it, right? Sometimes you need to help your, your colleagues. Sometimes you need to, you know, talk to legal. Sometimes you need to work with operations and like do the nitty gritty of like, this is late, that's late. And you need to talk timelines or you need to talk, um, you know, financials and budget and money. And that's not the fun part, but you have to do it. And again, back to Kia's point, it's the passion that gets you through that. So you can do the fun stuff. Um, so I always tell people like, never think something is be beneath you, right? Like a job right. is beneath right. you. Yeah. So I'm also going to say for those of you who are like, how am I going to break into this industry? Right. There's things you need in your portfolio to do it. Um, as in the fit em challenge, right? So here's the thing that you want to be able to show your passion to the panelists here. You want to be able to show it to me. You want to be able to show it to the world. Take this on. All right, so in the chat, they're going to re-put the, the, there's an information sheet that details in detail what the challenge is. There's also the information sheets for the um, actual ingredients that you need to use. And remember, you have to be inspired by these ingredients. And then you get up your video. This is where you get to start showing it. And it's like, let's say it doesn't even show just, you know, you're like, well, it's, you know, it's just the fit and challenge. Well, first of all, if you um, ever want to know, just go on to LinkedIn, type in FIDM and beauty, and you'll see where every FITM alum is permeating in this industry. And if you hashtag FITM challenge on that, they're going to see it. So first of all, you're going to have great exposure to the industry. But second of all, you've got a portfolio piece, and that's important. you got something to put on your Instagram that maybe somebody from the industry would see and say, how on earth did that person come up with that amazing idea? So take on the challenge, do it, use us as inspiration, use us as guidance. I'm going to give you my email all right i'm probably insane for doing this but they'll also put it in the chat for you you can reach out to me at tperez at fidm.edu 
So if you have any specific questions, if you're stuck on a hurdle, if you need some guidance, send me a message and I'll send it out to whoever we need to get you some help as well, because that's what we're here for. So any last words of advice from any of you for the people online today or, you know, because we're going to be signing off. So anything y'all want to say? I would say just have fun. Yeah. yeah, follow your gut and have fun with it. I mean, take advantage and don't limit yourself. Yeah. And if you have the opportunity, if you, you know you're you have the opportunity to come to FITM or to even consider FITM, I highly recommend that you really look into it and take seriously coming in because like the like everybody's mentioned earlier, it's a networking school. It's going to help open so many doors. The knowledge you're going to learn because most of your instructors, especially in those final years, are in the industry, you're going to be learning firsthand from people that are holding the jobs like everybody on this panel, how to do the jobs and it's really going to help you. I've seen a lot of questions on how to break into the industry, how to get into beauty. I, I at least my path when I was at CEO, we only you know, it, it is just extremely competitive and so many people want to enter this industry because oh I love beauty and it's just like you got to have more than that. I'm sorry, you do. Um, and you have to find a way in. Um, and it's just because you look, I mean, passion is required. Knowledge is also required, right? So um, it's a way. Thank you, Caitlin. All right. So everybody, I can't thank you enough. Um, it has been my sheer joy and pleasure. Uh, one of the best parts of my job is, is you, is you as alumni, you as teachers, you as industry. Um, you know, people I get to hang out with and I get to learn from and I get to be inspired by. And all of you who've been online with us today, that's also been, I loved your questions. I loved your comments. I loved your chats. Thank you for that. Um, we're here for you and get out there and, you know, live your life and love your passion, you know, just enjoy. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good luck, everyone. Good luck, everyone. Bye.